Conversemos es una iniciativa de las coaliciones internacionales de The Gospel Coalition en las que buscamos reunir a líderes y pastores de todo el mundo para hablar sobre los grandes retos y preguntas que enfrenta la Iglesia global, dándoles respuestas precisas y centradas en el Evangelio desde perspectivas diferentes que enriquecerán nuestra comprensión de las Escrituras y nuestro conocimiento de Dios. Bienvenidos. Hola a todos, qué gusto poder saludarlos en este día. Para nosotros es un gran placer como Coalición por el Evangelio poder ofrecer este tipo de recursos y hoy especialmente una conversación con un invitado muy especial. Eh, mi nombre es Fabio Rossi, yo soy eh, director de operaciones en Coalición por el Evangelio y hoy estoy, tengo el privilegio de estar con Justin Burkholder, que es parte del Consejo Pastoral de Coalición y también es pastor aquí en Guatemala de la Iglesia Reforma. Uh -huh. eh, y queremos tener este tiempo para conversar con un maestro que admiramos mucho, que uh -huh. es muy reconocido en el mundo evangélico, eh, comentarista bíblico. Eh, y voy a permitir que Justin nos diga quién es y nos puede introducir un poco a esta conversación uh -huh. con nuestro invitado especial hoy. Gracias, Fabio. Sí, tenemos hoy la bendición de estar platicando con el doctor Don Carson, que él es eh, profesor de investigación de Nuevo Testamento en Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Y él es también el cofundador de um, The Gospel Coalition con Tim Keller. Entonces, tenemos el, el privilegio de estar platicando con él un poquito acerca de algunos temas de actualidad en América Latina, hablar de la iglesia, hablar de doctrina. Bueno, vamos a hablar de varios diferentes temas, los que eh, nos alcancen con el tiempo. Pero queríamos eh, empezar de una vez escuchando al doctor Carson. Doctor, en, en medio de este tiempo de pandemia, eh, por supuesto que la iglesia ha tenido que encontrar maneras de, de fortalecer comunidad no pudiendo reunirse y uh, las reuniones en línea han servido como eh, ese método para fortalecer esa comunidad. Sin embargo, pueden haber riesgos. ¿Usted, ¿Usted cree que la reunión presencial podrá ser debilitada por estos métodos o, o quizás qué rol, eh, cómo podemos entender la reunión pública y presencial de la iglesia a la luz de las escrituras? Bueno, well, let me begin by Uh, saying that it's a privilege and an honor to join the brothers and sisters in Latin America. The question obviously has been generated by COVID-19, the coronavirus. Um, I think that it is helpful to recognize that there are other parts of the world where there is a similar set of questions, but for different reasons. So, for example, on the mainland of China, Increasingly, there is severe persecution that the church is facing. And in some sectors, churches that belong to the underground church sector are no longer permitted to meet. So here you have Christians not gathering, or at least not gathering as they are used to gathering, uh, not because of COVID-19, but because of persecution. Does that make them any less the church? In other words, there can be different reasons for gathering and not gathering. I would worry about a church which has every privilege to gather, but doesn't do so, because that would be generating a kind of lone ranger Christianity, uh, the, the emphasis on the individual and not on the gathering. But the gathering itself, although it manifests itself in Christians assembling together, an assembly of Christians, Yet the gathering itself is more fundamental. Uh, remember what Hebrews 12 says. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storms. That is the way the people of God gathered at Mount Sinai in the Old Testament. You have not gathered in that way before a mountain to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it beg that no further word be spoken to them. The nature of our gathering is not like that. Rather, Hebrews 12, 22, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all the spirits of the righteous made perfect to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, and so on and so on. 
In other words, there is a real spiritual gathering before the presence of God that Christians participate in if they really are truly Christians. So that the gathering that we experience in our assemblies is a kind of microcosm of that. It's a kind of physical reflection of that. It's, a, it's an outcropping of the universal gathering that we have before the presence of Christ, before the throne of God. It's seen in another passage in a slightly different way, a passage like Colossians chapter 3, where we're told that we have been raised with Christ. Well, in one sense, we're not raised yet. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 makes it very clear that we're waiting for the resurrection of the last day. So we have been justified, and we are being sanctified, but we have not yet been resurrected. Yet there is a sense in which we're so identified with Christ, we're identified with Christ in his death, that that Paul can say, um, uh, I am crucified with Christ, yet nevertheless I live. And now Paul can say in Colossians chapter 3, um, we have been raised with Christ. We're so identified with Christ in his resurrection that, that God, as it were, looks at us as resurrected beings because we're identified with Christ in his resurrection. So in exactly the same way, we are gathered before the throne of God and our first awareness of our gathering is being gathered as brothers and sisters in Christ around the great throne of God, um, already reconciled to him, accepted before him, and our gathering together in local church meetings and so on is a manifestation of that in, in space and time. It's, it's what happens normally. So if then we're forbidden that or we can't do much of it, we'll find other ways of doing what we can do. Smaller groups, Zoom meetings, um, distancing. In, in the local church that I go to during the summer months, um, we had parking lot meetings. People came and drove up to the parking lot and, and, and uh, could follow in, on their iPhones and so on within their cars. We also had uh, uh, stri live streaming. And now that the weather's got cold where I live, um, we're allowed to meet back in our building so long as everybody wears masks and we've observed social distancing. So instead of 400 people meeting in a room that's packed out, we meet 100 at a time, uh, one, in 25, one, one, one uh, in 25. And um, so, so there are ways of compensating. And then there are compensations that you can make by spending a lot more time on the phone and, um, and uh, being aware of those who are particularly cut off or lonely. Um, so the church, if it is the church at all, if Christians are aware of their status before Christ, they will find ways of getting together. And um, one of the things we can do is anticipate coming together uh, so that, so, so that, Maybe we're restricted at the moment, but we should be talking up what it will be like when the coronavirus has been, been settled, maybe with a vaccine, how good it will be when we come together. And um, then we'll, we'll, we'll be greeting one another with a holy kiss, with a fresh uh, appreciation and love for one another and so on. So, um, yeah, it is awkward, but it's no more awkward than what brothers and sisters have to face in parts of the world where they're forbidden, not because of the coronavirus, but because of, of the governmental pressure. Um, and they find ways. Uh, the church meets underground. The church meets in caves, according to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Um, uh, we, we find ways because we belong together and we are gathered in principle uh, around the great throne of God. Sí, me parece esta perspectiva más amplia uh -huh. que trae el doctor Carson a, a la conversación de pensar. Sí, nosotros pensamos en términos de, uh -huh. de, de nuestra situación actual con COVID que está en todo el mundo, pero también hablamos de una iglesia que es perseguida, que no se reúne, y uh -huh. es cierto. Eh, y esta época nos presenta muchos retos, no uh -huh. solo para pastores y líderes, pero para la iglesia en general, uh -huh. para el cuerpo de Cristo. Y, y en línea con eso, doctor Carson, queríamos preguntar también, eh, ¿Cuál, ¿Cuáles serían o cuáles deberían ser las prioridades? Yo diría no solo, tal vez principalmente de los pastores y líderes en este tiempo con respecto al cuidado pastoral de la iglesia, pero también cuáles serían esas prioridades como miembros de la iglesia, lo que deberíamos tener presente uh, 
a, en medio de esta situación como mm -hmm. nuestro ministerio. The first priority for ministers of the gospel is to observe the same priorities as usual. In other words, we're called in the first instance to the ministry of the word and prayer, uh, to use the language of the book of Acts. Uh, and that continues. Now, the way it works out, the way it's practiced, will be different. But the priorities themselves must be observed. Um, so that if you cannot speak to 200 or 500 or 700 or whatever, um, and can only speak to small groups, then you speak to small groups. If you cannot speak in person, then you use whatever technology helps. But it's still the priority of the ministry of the word and prayer. And if it means uh, uh, spending more time on the phone or on Zoom, um, then it's still the ministry of the word and prayer that takes the priority. Now, the additional factor, and it's an important one, is that some churches uh, have a lot of poor people in them whose uh, habit it is to live from paycheck to paycheck, and, um, and, and then they lose their job because of the coronavirus. And suddenly you have hungry people in the church that you didn't have before. And the church wants to take care of those hungry people and make sure that nobody's falling between the cracks. Maybe there are elderly folk that are living on their own that can't get out, and so they're feeling particularly lonely. What can the church do to help? And once again, I would say the leaders in the church, the elders in the church, still are called, first of all, to the ministry of the word and prayer. But part of leadership is organizing the church to meet the needs that show up. So uh, in the book of Acts, for example, when, when uh, there, there, there was a recognition that there needed to be the distribution of food and, and so on in an equitable fashion, The apostles passed it on to people who ultimately became deacons um, because they wanted to give themselves over to the ministry of the word and prayer. So I can imagine in a, in a, in a church um, like the one I've described, uh, the, the pastors will exercise leadership, godly pastoral leadership, by helping to organize Christians in the church who are in families to keep in constant touch with some who are single or alone or elderly or poor or disadvantaged. Um, there are ways of organizing food chains and food lines and so on, so that nobody is forgotten. And now, it would be a mistake for pastors, elders, to take on that ministry on their own at the expense of the ministry of the word and prayer, which means study, prayers, delivery of, of encouraging words and so on. But on the other hand, Um, they should oversee it in such a way that they find people who can organize uh, who's phoning which person of the church so that nobody's left out, making sure that everybody has all that they need and so on. Um, that's part of care for the church flock. But it's within the matrix of the primacy of the ministry of the word and prayer, teaching the whole counsel of God, engaging in Bible study, whether it's one-on-one -on -one Uh, by a telephone call or a Zoom call and so on. Still the same priorities, but the organization and structure is going to be a little different under COVID-19. Una de las cosas interesantes, obviamente, que él menciona es esta idea de que una de las prioridades o los papeles principales de los líderes es el Ministerio de la Palabra. Y hemos escuchado mucho eh, dentro de nuestros círculos en particular esta idea de sana doctrina, mm. eh, de enseñar sana doctrina. Y, y, y consideramos, doctor Carson, que sería interesante escucharle a usted definir qué, qué es la sana doctrina y cómo sabemos si la sabemos o que la estamos enseñando. Y quizás añadido a eso porque toda esta situación eh, como que complica más este tema de la sana doctrina mm -hmm. porque ahora... Hay sermones predicándose por todos lados y hay tanto acceso, quizás aún más, eh, más importante, eh, más que, importante que, sí, es importante que podamos identificar uh -huh. qué es la sana doctrina. Uh -huh. The expression sound doctrine, of course, comes from the pastoral epistles. It's uh, an expression that Paul uses writing to Timothy. Um, but... Uh, at one level, the question that is being raised is very easy to answer. And at another level, it's quite difficult. It's, it's easy to answer in the sense that sound doctrine is that which reflects the word of God. 
It's a reflection of what God has himself already disclosed in his holy word. And, um, and, and, and therefore that which departs from holy scripture, uh, that which ignores it or, or obfuscates it or distorts it and so on is less sound. Um, on, on the other hand, one has to recognize that not every matter in doctrine has exactly the same importance. Now, in one sense, all truth is God's truth. All truth is important. Uh, yet, I recommend a, a little book that has come out in the last six months by Gavin Ortland called uh, Choosing the Hill to Die On. Uh, now, that expression, a hill to die on, is what you really fight for to the death, choosing the hill to die on. In other words, he's arguing for what he calls uh, the case for theological triage. In, in an accident, the, the medical experts who arrive on the scene um, engage in medical triage to find out who needs to be treated first and and uh, who can be saved by medical care and so on. And then they organize their teams accordingly. But there is a kind of theological triage. Not every doctrine in scripture has exactly the same weight as, 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 as another doctrine. Um, there are some doctrines which if you disown them or distance yourself from them or deny them, then um, you are you have abandoned the faith. You are in a terrible state. Think of what Paul writes to the Galatians in Galatians chapter one. If we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel in the gospel we have preached to you. Let him be anathema. Um, so there there are some doctrines the absence of which or the contradiction of which damns. And and in in that case, uh, uh, it, it's it's most serious. On the other hand, Paul can write to the Philippians and encourage them to follow on. He himself, he says, has not arrived, but is pressing on toward the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And then he says in Philippians chapter three, all of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, so there's some difference. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. In other words, there's a recognition by Paul, that some people in Philippi look at some things a bit differently, but from Paul's perspective, it's not the sort of thing that condemns, like the Galatian heresy, mm -hmm. and it's the sort of thing that apparently is bound up with their immaturity. God will teach you in due course how this works a little better. And, and so um, there is a case of for, for line upon line, line upon line, when a person becomes a Christian, he or she does not have it all sorted out immediately. You cannot expect a brand new baby Christian to get everything right and how to articulate the doctrine of the Trinity. Mm. Now, what would be more troubling is if somebody became a Christian, studied the doctrine of the Trinity and decided that he or she didn't believe it. Then it becomes far more troubling because you are beginning to fight against what Holy Scripture says. But baby Christians might have a pretty skewed idea of some of these things um, and find it really quite difficult to defend, let's say, the deity of Christ um, because they're just too inexperienced with the categories of Scripture. So, so a, a, a theological triage will recognize that people are in different states of, of uh, understanding, of comprehension, of maturity, and so on. And, and recognize that sound doctrine in the ultimate sense is getting everything right in line with scripture. But sound doctrine for a baby Christian, uh, well, uh, Paul wants people to have more than just pablum, just milk, just baby food. Uh, by this time, Paul says you should be eating strong meat. And the fact that you're not doing so shows that you're still immature. So he's engaging in a certain kind of theological triage. And, um, and, and, and so uh, I don't think that in practice you can answer the question, what is sound doctrine, with a simple list. Uh, the mm -hmm. following 13 doctrines are sound. Uh, the rest doesn't matter. It, it, because what is uh, of, of fundamental importance may vary in the degree of maturity of the, of the, of the Christian, um, what things are being denied, um, what the temptations are in a particular area. Uh, 
Um, uh, so so on, on some points, for example, you may agree wholeheartedly with a Catholic on, the, let's say, the doctrine of the Trinity, but disagree pretty strongly on the primacy of grace in salvation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, whereas in another part of the world, um, you, your points of dispute may be something else because, because uh, uh, the, the, the surrounding discussion is, is of a different sort. It, you're not surrounded by uh, Roman Catholics, you might be surrounded by Buddhists. What does discussion look like in that context? So at the simplest level, as I've said, sound doctrine is that which is in line with Holy Scripture. In terms of what you fight for and disagree over and so on, it's going to sh be shaped by uh, a lot of other factors. Hay algo, pues, eh, eh, como dijo el doctor Carson, es una pregunta como que la puede uno responder sí. sencillo en un nivel muy complicado en el otro. Eh, quizás un, un pequeño paréntesis, cuando él hablaba de, de, del triaje, los que no conocen acerca de qué es esto del triaje teológico, mm -hmm. Hay contenido en la página de coalición que sí. puedes ver, que puedes revisar. Es muy, muy interesante, muy importante que podamos profundizar en esto, que es parte de la respuesta que nos ha dado el doctor Carson. Y también estoy casi seguro que el libro que he mencionado del doctor Orlund está haciendo, si no ya está traducido, está en proceso de traducción no, y también sí. es, es un excelente recurso. Uh -huh. Pero volviendo al tema, es, es cuando hablamos de sana doctrina, eh, también hablamos de, de qué tan unidos estamos mm -hmm. en el Evangelio o qué tan divididos estamos. Si uno mira denominación tras denominación, de iglesia tras iglesia, que van caminando como llaneros solitarios mm -hmm. y uno percibe mucha división en la Iglesia de Cristo. Y el doctor Carson ha escrito eh, un comentario de, del Evangelio de Juan que es, de, creo yo, de los más respetados y reconocidos. Y, y hay una frase en Juan capítulo 17 que, que contiene una petición interesante de Jesús. Uh -huh. Y es cuando Jesús pide al Padre que ellos sean uno. Uh -huh. eh, la pregunta, doctor Carson, es a qué unidad se está refiriendo Jesús aquí. Y, y en medio de, de todo esto que nosotros vivimos en la iglesia latinoamericana, de tanta división que nosotros percibimos, eh, cómo la iglesia de Cristo puede perseguir, perseguir esa unidad sin sacrificar el evangelio. Mm -hmm. That's really a crucial question and of course it is uh, uh, tied with the previous uh, points of discussion. Um, I think that it's helpful to recognize that in the Bible um, there is not a univocal emphasis on unity. In other words, unity is not an absolute good. Unity is a contextual good whereas truth is an absolute good. Let me explain what I mean. King Jehoshaphat in the Old Testament, for example, decided he would enter into uh, a common cause with the uh, idolatrous king of, a of, of Israel. And, um, and, and that was a unity that God condemned. So, so it's not that all unity is good. Some unity is bad. Um, So similarly, um, in 2 Corinthians, the church is being seduced by those whom the apostle Paul calls false apostles, masquerading as teachers of light, where, whereas in point of fact, they are leading people astray. There's no point in yelling, give me unity, give me unity, stop criticizing, stop criticizing, because in that case, the unity is a unity that's not built on truth. It's not built on Uh, genuine Christian commitments. It's, it's built on uh, a, a mixture. Uh, don't forget that Paul elsewhere can say, what fellowship does light have with darkness? Um, so unity is not an absolute good. Uh, unity that is grounded in the truth, uh, unity that loves the light, unity that is full of self-sacrifice for the sake of others, uh, unity that's grounded in the gospel, uh, that's terrific. Um, and so you want the unity in the body of Christ to be manifested in real terms. Um, so in John chapter 17, Christ has in mind not only the spiritual unity that is the effect of the gospel in people's lives, but he 
by praying that, that they might be one and even as, as he and his father are one. He wants that to be so deep that it affects how they live and how they think and how they love and how they interact with each other, how they serve, a unity of mind and, and purpose and so on. Um, uh, but all of that presupposes that there is a common shared understanding of what the gospel is. Um, in, in Paul's letter to the Philippians, uh, which is one of the New Testament books that most stresses uh, unity. Uh, about 10 times he tells them that they should think the same thing, that they should all be in agreement. Now that does not mean that they should agree to differ. That's the way it's often understood, just agree to differ. On some points, Paul does want people to agree to differ in the hope that eventually others will come to have a better, more mature understanding of the truth. But, but the appeal to think the same thing presupposes that there is a common commitment like the Christians in Berea who check the scriptures out to see if these things are so. You, you come to think the same thing by studying and studying and working together and bowing to the authority of scripture and self-correction and being, being corrected by holy writ, by mature Christians and so on, so on, so on. So that the unity is perfected precisely by discussion, godly study, uh, bowing before the authority of the word and so on. Uh, after a while, you Christians get to know who, which, which Christians in a local church, which Christians in an area are uh, most informed, most mature in their grasp of scripture. And, 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 and so they seek them out and, and seek advice and counsel and teaching and so on. Um, so, so all of this to say uh, what I said at the beginning of this exchange, that Unity is not an absolute good. Uh, there, there can be a unity between um, um, Hitler and Stalin, which was not a unity of godliness. It was a, a unity of convenience that led to terrible bloodshed, and terrible sacrifice and slaughter of millions of people. Um, so, so for Christians, likewise, you want to avoid the kind of unity that compromises the gospel, that compromises truth, while still at the same time building the kind of of personal relationships uh, grounded in the gospel, grounded in submission to the Lordship of Christ, grounded in the joy of the Lord, which is our strength, grounded in um, the common grounding uh, before King Jesus so that we bow the knee and acknowledge one Lord, mm. one faith, one mm. baptism. Mm. Sí, ese, ese balance entre unidad y verdad, obviamente, es un balance complejo. Y, y... Todos los que servimos en América Latina hemos estado en situaciones donde, pues sí, nos, nos corresponde a ver, a, a hacer esas evaluaciones de dónde es que estamos parados. Y, y, y no solo eso, hay ciertos temas que generan mucha confusión y a veces esa confusión en sí lleva a, a, a división o a unidad que quizás no debería, no debería verse. Y, y por lo menos en... En nuestro caso, yo no sé si lo has visto, pero uno de los temas que genera mucha de esa confusión es todo el tema de guerra, de guerra espiritual. Una gran y pregunta que siempre hay en el medio. Enorme pregunta y, y mucha confusión. Y, y lo que vemos a lo largo de los evangelios es una actividad demoníaca constante. ¿verdad? Jesús siempre está interactuando con, con ciertas experiencias, personas, situaciones... Um, pero eso yo creo que luego genera aún más la duda para nosotros. No, no vemos en nuestro contexto, en muchos casos, esos tipos de, esos tipos de experiencias demoníacas. Entonces, um, doctor Carson, yo creo que la pregunta para nosotros es ¿cómo deberíamos nosotros hoy en día entender la actividad demoníaca? ¿Existe tal cosa como la guerra espiritual y podríamos decir que nos encontramos en guerra espiritual let me begin with a a, a reference to c.s lewis an, an english writer uh, who had a way of uh, encapsulating profound thoughts in easily memorized terms he said that there are two things that you can do wrong with respect to the devil the one is act as if mm. he doesn't mm -hmm. exist mm -hmm. the other is focus too much attention on them. And so it is with spiritual warfare. I worry about people who engage in what they call spiritual warfare, and that's all they do. They don't preach the gospel. Their people are not taught the whole counsel of God. 
They don't read the Bible from cover to cover. They don't understand the Bible's storyline. Um, what they're engaged in all the time is what they call spiritual warfare. And it becomes almost a kind of, of, of focus on mm -hmm. exorcism, a focus on, on, on the demonic, which at the end of the day often leads to real disaster. I could tell you some horrible stories of, of, uh, of uh, uh, people abandoning the faith and, and, and being corrupted by this focus on, by itself. On the other hand, in a secular age, it's possible to become so aloof from spiritual realities that you forget all that is said about spiritual warfare. Um, uh, we remember what Paul wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter six, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the, you know, the, the, the devil himself. Now that's very interesting because, because clearly some people were thinking that they were wrestling against flesh and blood, against political systems, against um, uh, economic systems, against corruption and so on. So that all of the answers that are being put forward are political, social, economic, cultural, and so on. Uh, whereas Paul says, no, 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 behind all of those powers, there is demonic power. And so that our fundamental wrestling is at a deeper level. Um, so that's not to deny that there is a place for casting out demons, not, not at all. But it's recognizing that we are engaged in a cosmic conflict that is much bigger than simply casting out a demon here or there. What's also worth paying attention to is that the person in the New Testament who is most likely to cast out demons is the Lord Jesus himself. Mm. And he does so with perfect awareness that he has all the authority to do so. Uh, even the, the, the demons uh, are aware of their feebleness before Christ. Uh, don't do this, don't send us to the pit, don't send, send us to the pigs instead. Uh, we, 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 we know that we're going to be confined to the abyss in, at the end of time, don't do it to us yet. They're afraid, they're frightened of him. So that Jesus has a unique awareness of authority over uh, the, the, the powers of darkness and, and, and his strugglings are not uh, too surprising when the devil tries to, to, um, to, 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 to seduce him in, the, in, in his temptations, to take him away from, from the cross, get behind me, Satan, he says to uh, Peter in Caesarea Philippi, Matthew chapter 16, so that, so that Peter is giving what he thinks is good advice. You don't need to die. Um, someone with your power, a Messiah with your power doesn't need to die. But, but, but Jesus is sensitive enough that he recognizes that behind this word from Peter is the devil himself. And so he says, get behind me, Satan. So it, it takes the insight of Christ, the, the understanding of Christ, the, the perception of Christ sometimes to see that behind what seem to be human bits of advice, human principalities and powers and so on, is nevertheless the work of the devil himself. So one of the reasons why the gospels show so much of this conflict with the powers of darkness is precisely because Christ has unique ability to perceive things that we don't. And, and so that when you read, oh, Paul's letter to the Galatians or Paul's letters to the Thessalonians or Paul's letter uh, to the Philippians or Paul's letter to the Corinthians and so on, though he can make reference to demonic powers and satanic forces and so on, he's not casting out a demon every time he turns around. A lot of it is argumentation. It's, it's what does scripture say? It's, it's thinking through what scripture teaches and so on. So, so we're back through the back door to C.S. Lewis. If you focus so much on demonic activity and how to fight it, um, then you, you can be missing the real struggle. Uh, you can be missing how the devil stands behind human utterances, behind uh, human powers behind political machinations and so on. And you don't want to get uh, bogged down by merely human elements. You must see that, that your struggle ultimately is with the devil himself. But on the other hand, that should not result in a kind of abracadabra piece of magic that mm. means that your solution for everything is an exorcism. Um, 
So it's it's a bigger question. It's than than uh, merely looking for more demons to cast out in order to become more biblical. Um, David did not primarily cast out demons. Paul does not primarily cast out demon, demons. Uh, uh, Peter does not primarily cast out demons. And, and yet they are all aware of the demonic cosmic nature of evil and, and, and the powers of darkness that we have to confront. And so it's one of those cases where to get the balance right, one needs the whole counsel of God, what you find across the whole of scripture, rather than a few proof texts in the Gospels. Esto que dice el doctor Carson me, me gusta mucho porque creo que va en línea con todo lo que hemos venido conversando, la, la importancia, la centralidad de las escrituras en, en toda la vida, en todo el ministerio, en todo lo que sí. hacemos. Es lo que trae ese balance tanto para la unidad como para la división como para entender esto que estamos discutiendo acerca de la actividad demoníaca. Y, y eso nos lleva a, a la siguiente pregunta, doctor Carson, porque la mayoría, podríamos decir, de pastores en Latinoamérica no tienen estudios bíblicos, teológicos, formales. Eh, y, y una pregunta es, ¿qué tan importante es que un pastor tenga estudios bíblicos y teológicos para ejercer el pastorado, ¿es eso, el no tenerlas, es algo que lo descalifica o, o, o es algo que le impide llevar a cabo, eh, llevar a cabo ese llamamiento pastoral? Eh, y la otra pregunta sería, ¿qué consejo le daría a usted a estos pastores que están ahí afuera, que ya están pastoreando congregaciones, mm. que no mm. tienen estudios teológicos doctrinales? ¿Qué palabra le daría a usted a ellos en este sí. tiempo? Once again, I think that there are variables. Occasionally, a church is growing so fast amongst a, a people that is semi-literate that the pastors themselves are only a few steps ahead of, of, of where the rest of the church is. Um, I grew up in French Canada. And um, for years, evangelicalism was not growing. Uh, in a population of about six and a half million people, We had about 35 churches, none of them with more than about 40 people. And then in eight years, we grew from 35 churches to about 500. And, um, and, and many of these churches had hundreds of people. And where, where were the pastors coming from? You couldn't bring them in from English Canada. Um, they didn't speak French. And, and so we had many, many pastors with minimal theological training um, who, who, who were trying to shepherd people who were only six months younger in Christ than they were. <laughs> it, it, it's a dangerous situation. It was, it was exciting, but it, it was also very dangerous. So another variable is not only the speed with which churches may grow under certain circumstances, but, but what is the educational background of the congregation? If, if you have a congregation with most people without more than grade eight education or grade 10 education. That's one thing. If you have a lot of people in the congregation who already have university degrees, uh, that's another thing. You, you would expect the pastor in the latter case to, 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 to have to have more education himself. And, and then there are some people who are more gifted than others. Uh, Charles Spurgeon started preaching when he was 17 or 18. Mm -hmm. And, um, Uh, he was contemplating going off to university to get more training. And as he walked across a meadow one night, he said, I thought I heard a voice behind me saying, seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not, seek them not. So that in his case, he understood this to mean um, pursuit of more education in his particular case would be bound up with a desire to be well-known, well-respected, admired, seeking great things for himself. And that for him would be a trap. But on the other hand, Spurgeon was an autodidact. He was someone who could teach himself. He read and grew. He came to read Greek and Hebrew fluently. Um, he, his his re reading of Christian literature was absolutely voracious. All you have to do is read, for example, his Treasury of David, six volumes on the Psalms, to, 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 gr to grasp how, how spectacularly learned he was. Um, on the other hand, uh, just because uh, a Martin Lloyd-Jones or a Charles Spurgeon 
uh, can get away with very little theological education, it doesn't mean that everybody can, because not everybody has their gifts, their theological acumen. Mm -hmm. They're not able to teach themselves uh, the way those men were able to teach themselves. So one suspects that it is wrong to simply lay down a rule. Everybody must have a, a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or a doctoral degree before you can teach in the church of God. It's going to vary from church to church, uh, from person to person and so on. Um, but what I would say is this, according to Holy Scripture, uh, Paul writes to Timothy and says, um, uh, let all observe your progress. Mm. So I worry about any pastor who's stuck in a rut and not growing in knowledge mm -hmm. and understanding uh, and, and conformity to Christ and maturity. I, I want a church to be able to say, you know, our pastor was interesting to listen to five years ago, but he's richer and deeper now. He's mm. growing constantly in the faith. It's, it's wonderful to hear him expound the word to us now. Now, for the vast majority of people, that's going to happen because he's, he's continuing to study and to study formally. So get all the education you can. But on the other hand, if you get called to the ministry, supposing you get converted at the age of 30, and you get called to the ministry at the, the age of 34, 35, you already have four kids, and you don't have any money for going away to school, and then, then you have no choice but to start preaching and teaching with what you've got. And, and hopefully you can find a mentor to tell you what to read next and, and keep growing in, 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 uh, in theological understanding. Formal theological education does not guarantee spiritual maturity. But on the other hand, if you are continuing to grow such that people can see your growth, um, then presumably you're going to continue getting more education, more, more reading, more knowledge under your belt, whether that's of a formal uh, variety or an informal variety is of entirely secondary mm. importance. Mm. Sí, es, es interesante porque obviamente la falta de educación formal no es una excusa para la pereza teológica, al final es. de cuentas. O sea, hay todavía una intencionalidad y un crecimiento que como líderes eclesiásticos deberíamos estar procurando y persiguiendo. Y, y obviamente cuando no hay por lo menos una, una eh, eh, convicción teológica y un aprendizaje teológico, ya sea formal o informal, eso ya se presta para, para ciertos errores y aún la proclamación de mensajes aberrantes o tergiversados heréticos a final, a final de cuentas. Y, y obviamente, doctor Carson, en, en, en América Latina una de las situaciones complejas para la iglesia es la presencia de mucha teología de, de prosperidad. De, en, en su entendimiento, ¿cuál diría usted que es el error central de la teología de la prosperidad y, y cómo la podemos identificar y cómo deberíamos responder a ella? The central error is biblical illiteracy. That is, the people who are pushing prosperity gospel collect a variety of proof texts, put them together, and make a whole Christian religion out of it without understanding how the Bible is put together. You show me a church that has been characterized by really excellent preaching and teaching, expository preaching and teaching for years and years, and I'll show you a church that won't be seduced by the prosperity gospel. So I can come to specific things that are overlooked, but at the end of the day, what is needed to confront this is the kind of teaching and preaching of the whole counsel of God that ultimately makes the prosperity gospel look silly. It's not only wicked, it's silly. Hmm. Think of all the things that are said about if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. So there's no real theology of suffering. Hmm. Or take up your cross and follow me. That's not just a, a, a piece of magic. That means that you, you are committed to dying daily, to, to be crucified mm -hmm. daily with Christ. And um, uh, the, the theology of, of, of what Christ achieved presented not only as what Christ did in the cross on our behalf, but what Christ did on the cross as a model for us. As Peter puts it in 1 Peter chapter 2, it's not only that he bore our sins in his own body on the cross, 
but also he left us an example, uh, teaching us how to follow him uh, in our own living. Uh, so all of that sort of side of thing is ignored in, in the hope of, of focusing on benefits here and now. And, and it's not that there are no benefits here and now. It's not that God cannot or does not provide material blessings. But when that becomes the whole center of the gospel, it misunderstands the cross. It misunderstands what Christ came for. It misunderstands the new heaven and the new earth. It misunderstands the resurrection body. It misunderstands what we long for. It misunderstands the nature of holiness. It misunderstands the nature of what the cross achieved. And so it, it's just wrong again and again. It's biblically illiterate. It's, it's a cultic uh, distortion. And, and it has happened at the end of the day, first of all, because of biblical mm -hmm. illiteracy. Mm -hmm. Sí, es, eh, la verdad es que nuevamente otra vez es el centro de, de las escrituras, la centralidad del evangelio en, en todo lo que, lo que nosotros hacemos. Y además de este tema de, de la actividad demoníaca, del evangelio de la prosperidad y todo, hay algunos otros temas quizás de menor uh -huh. relevancia, podríamos decir, pero que siempre están presentes en la iglesia. Preguntas muy comunes que van surgiendo uh -huh. eh, en la iglesia de Cristo. Y una de ellas es esta, doctor Carson, eh, ante no solo su conocimiento de la palabra, pero también su experiencia como pastor. Eh, hay, podríamos decir que hay algún mínimo de edad apropiado con respecto a la práctica de los sacramentos, del bautismo mm. y de la comunión. Eh, y también otra pregunta que es muy interesante que muchos padres hacen. Mm. Eh, lo vemos en las escuelitas bíblicas, ¿no? Mm -hmm. Cuando se mm -hmm. predica el evangelio y los niños levantan la mano y no sabes si realmente entendió o no entendió el evangelio. Eh, ¿Cómo podemos saber o cómo podemos confirmar que un niño ha entendido el evangelio mm -hmm. de Cristo en mm -hmm. realidad? I think that I should say by way of warning that there are some evangelical churches which are, after all, pedo baptist That is, they do what they call baptism of, of infants. Uh, so they don't face the kind of question you just raised. They face other questions, of course, uh, but we should at least acknowledge that they do exist mm -hmm. and are genuine believers, um, but with what is in my view, a mistaken understanding of, of the nature of baptism. But for churches of Baptist persuasion, which is really what you have in mind, um, there are basically two approaches that people take. Uh, one is to impose an arbitrary minimum age. So, so that you're brought up in a Christian home, you make profession of faith at whatever age, um, but you won't be baptized in such a church until you're 18 or whatever the age is, 13 or uh, whatever. I could mention some churches that you are familiar with uh, where those are the habits, the practices that are adopted. The reason why people make such rules is precisely because the New Testament doesn't. In, in other words, the New Testament doesn't speak to that question with perfect clarity. There's no passage that says, thou shalt not baptize thy children until the age of 13 or 18 or, or whatever. And so you're left, by, you're left with inferences as, as to what should be done. The other way is that, that it's, it's just whenever they ask for it. Uh, but the, the trouble is, as you yourself pointed out, uh, uh, w when you have uh, Sunday schools and Bible school VBSs and, and um, uh, all kinds of youth meetings and so on, it's, 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 it's very easy for children to be caught up in something or other and, um, and, and, and ask to be baptized because everybody's getting done. And so there are lots of kids that are baptized in Baptist churches at the age of five and six and seven and so on. And, and then the failure rate turns out to be astronomical. And pastors begin to ask, uh, surely there's a better way of proceeding than that. The best way that I am aware of historically was practiced by the Swiss Baptists in the 16th century uh, during the early years of the Protestant Reformation in Europe. Uh, they developed um, uh, a, a habit Uh, under uh, the teaching of a Baptist theologian called Hoopmeyer. You can find his writings yourself. Um, they developed the habit, when somebody asked for baptism in a local church, the elders would take that person aside and 
determine, this was their wording, determine whether or not the child has faced the subtle temptation of a broken world, been attracted to it, and then self-consciously rejected it mm. for Jesus' sake. Mm. Now, you can see the wisdom of that when you stop to think about it. Um, it. It's one thing for a kid following the godly parents that they enjoy and, and what's going on in their Sunday school and so on, just to want to do it because everybody else is doing it. But in the opinion of the elders, have, has this child actually felt the attraction of sin self-consciously? Felt the self-conscious attraction of secularism? felt the self-conscious attraction of turning your back on Christ and then, for Jesus' sake, rejecting it, precisely because Jesus is Lord. And when, in the opinion of the elders, such a child got to that point, then they baptize him. In other words, they didn't specify an age. They specified a kind of maturity, a kind of maturity that indicated that there was self-conscious attraction to Christ Jesus that overwhelmed the attraction to the world. Now, I could, if we had more time, I could tell you some stories of, of how that's been worked out in modern churches. Um, what is presupposed is that the elders involved take time to know the children of the church. Mm-hmm. You, you can't make a determination like that unless you get to know the child. Yeah. So it demands more pastoral care and, and insight. But I've seen this Swiss Baptist practice from the 1600s, um, uh, for, from the 1500s, the 16th century, uh, actually work out in, in, in some remarkably excellent ways in contemporary mm. churches. Mm. Qué respuesta más poderosa, um, uh, porque no simplemente se está evaluando si los niños tienen las respuestas correctas, mm. que a menudo eso yo creo que se nos facilita, pero el, el poder identificar fruto verdadero. Claro, y no solo que se nos facilita, no solo que los niños aprenden a responder uh-huh, uh-huh. lo que uno quiere oír. ¿no? Sí, es, sí. Es, es, es fácil instruirlos sí, así. Sí, sí. sí, sin duda, sí. Y esto de la madurez es realmente uno, un, uh-huh. una luz muy interesante, un uh-huh. ejemplo muy interesante que, que sin duda enriquece este... Estas preguntas, estas respuestas, estos acercamientos. Sí. Pues tal vez una última, una última pregunta que quisiéramos considerar con usted, doctor Carson. Nosotros estamos lastimosamente hoy en día escuchando de eh, crisis de líderes, quienes eh, fracasan, quienes eh, han caído en algún, algún pecado eh, que los ha descalificado o por lo menos manchado su testimonio, reputación delante del del mundo. Eh, nosotros aún en América Latina escuchamos de, de líderes eclesiásticos o líderes ministeriales de gran renombre que sale historias de inmoralidad en sus propias vidas. ¿Qué tipo de consejo o exhortación eh, le podrías dar a los pastores y los líderes que nos están escuchando hoy en día acerca de perseverar en la fe en medio de tanta tentación que sí existe en el mundo? The question, of course, is huge. And it's important to remember how often the New Testament speaks of the priority of perseverance. Um, That's what the entire epistle of the Hebrews is about, for example. Um, Jesus himself taught, he who perseveres to the end will be saved. Um, uh, You have been, been made partakers of Christ if you hold the beginning of your confidence steadfast to the end is what Hebrews 3.14 says. Um, So along with many, many passages that insist that Christ really does uphold his own people, there are many passages that say we have a responsibility for persevering to the end. So the question really becomes, what what fosters perseverance? What fosters strength to press on to the end? And I think that that varies a bit depending on the person. Um, If you're asking about pastors per se, it's obviously easier if there are two or three or four of them. In other words, if they are working with others, Mm -hmm. Uh, a pastor who's uh, working all on his own, uh, 
in a remote area without brothers and sisters in Christ around him is more likely to turn aside than someone who is being probed and encouraged. In other words, mutual encouragement, what the Bible calls edification, building one another up in our most holy faith, um, making time to do all of that is, is important. Um, and, and, and yet the biggest thing, I, I, could, I could mention a lot of mechanical details like getting enough sleep and not hmm. getting into despair and discouragement. You can mention all kinds of practical details like that. But the most important thing I think is this. It, it's the same in the political arena. Um, people want to come down on the left or the right. And they want pastors to come down on the left or the right in their comments. But more important than leading people towards the political left or the political right is leading people toward the sheer excellence of the gospel, mm -hmm. the sheer excellence of Christ. So in the political arena, I think that's what holds the church together. Churches can divide over politics, but they're much less likely to divide over politics if they are constantly presented with the sheer glories of Christ, his beauty, his attractiveness, his power, his sovereignty, his sway, his uh, love, uh, what he's bringing in on the last day, the new heaven and the new earth, home of righteousness. That's what we're really pressing for. And similarly, it's what encourages us to persevere. In other words, if you view the secret of perseverance to be bound up with a gimmick or a device or a habit or a certain reading and so on, then it's just mechanics. But if you are undertaking to, to, to learn the glories of Christ, to see how spectacular he is, then not to persevere becomes ugly. It, it becomes at best second class. It, it, it becomes self-pitying. Uh, if, if, if you learn from the New Testament, for example, as in, let's say, Colossians chapter 3, that we are to sing a song of gratitude. Mm. And so part of our enjoyment of Christ is to think of all the things from Christ for which we should be grateful. It's really hard to imagine spending time shacked up with a woman that you is, that is not your wife. If, if you're talking uh, in your own mind all the time about the glories of Christ and, and mm. how many things we are to be grateful for, uh, for him, what, what, Glories heaven will bring. Uh, no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain. Um, to love Christ with heart and soul and mind and strength and our neighbors as ourselves and so on. If those are the things that shape us such that we are grateful for them, um, uh, Christ will seem so attractive to us that, that, that the sin of seduction will seem ugly. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and thus the... The key, if I may put it this way, to perseverance is not by gritting your teeth and holding on for dear life. The key to perseverance is by conquering a sin, by, by uh, comparing the glories of Christ with the infinitely inferior glories of a passing mm -hmm. world that ultimately leads to destruction mm -hmm. and hell itself. Mm -hmm. Muchísimas gracias, doctor Carson, uh -huh. por, no solo por esta respuesta que nos alienta, sí. eh, que nos, nos impulsa a, a seguir buscando esto precisamente el Señor, su palabra, buscándolo a Él de todo corazón. Gracias por su tiempo. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Eh, por, damos gracias al Señor por la sabiduría, el conocimiento que le ha dado y por la oportunidad que nos da de compartir con usted uh -huh. eh, en este momento. Sí. sí, gracias por su legado, por su ministerio por su servicio. Así que ha sido un privilegio poder conversar con usted y con todos los que han, han podido sintonizar este video. Dios los bendiga. Mm -hmm.